Hello everyone, I am so very happy to be able to present this lecture to all of you. It's absolutely wonderful to see everyone all over the world. My name is Mehratu Petros Guta and I teach philosophy at Biola University, Addis Ababa University and Asusa Pacific University. Today I'm going to talk about the, you know, uh, the identity theory of mind. And talking about this notion, it's always important to get the notion of identity itself right. So if we don't really get that concept right, then it will be very, very difficult for us to be able to have grip on what the theory of identity is uh, all about. So that we have two notions of identity. Philosophers talk about identity in two uh, main uh, ways. Well, I understand that identity is all over the place. People talk about political identity, social identity, uh, identity as it relates to family, and so on and so forth. But in philosophy, in metaphysics, when we talk about identity, often what comes to our mind, especially at least for philosophers like me, is first, numerical identity. What is numerical identity? Here's an example. X is identical to Y. So you can understand x and y as variables. You can kind of replace them by anything you want. You can replace them by any proposition uh, or a statement, or you can replace them by, let's say, your own names or something like that. When we say that x is identical to y in a numerical sense, what we're really talking about is we are talking about one single object. That means that x is the same thing as y. So every time we talk about identity in its numerical sense, what should come to our mind is exactly one object. It does not matter how we happen to describe those items, but we are simply talking about one single object. So that is numerical identity. There's a second kind of identity called qualitative identity. Qualitative identity uh, can be described as follows. Consider x is an object and y is another object. If I say in a qualitative identity sense, x is identical to y, I'm not talking about one single object. I'm talking about two distinct objects that are completely agree in their properties. For example, they might have exactly similar size, exactly similar shape, exactly similar color. So when you look at those objects, you're really looking at two objects, but one to one you match all of their properties together. So numerical identity, one object, qualitative identity, exactly similar objects, but they are not single objects. You might wonder why should we actually uh, bother about this issue? The reason why we need to uh, make numerical identity and uh, qualitative identity uh, clear in our mind is because those concepts are very, very important when it comes to the debate between, for example, people who defend what we call substance dualism or dualism of some sort and, uh, you know, physicalism, you know, type identity physicalism or other versions of physicalism. Here in my lecture, I'm not going to survey all kinds of different diverse um, versions of physicalism or uh, dualism. I'm just going to simply talk about historically extremely important kind of dualism that really kind of uh, became a poster child for all other subsequent uh, uh, controversies and debates with respect to, uh, let's say, human nature. So there are two notions of uh, uh, you know, dualism. Of course, there are so many versions, but I'm just going to kind of pick on two of the most important ones for uh, you know, the purpose of this talk. So historically, if you know Descartes, uh, uh, René Descartes, the French philosopher of 17th century, he introduced uh, a, a view of dualism that we call today substance dualism. Substance dualism has got interesting features. Substance dualism uh, embraces the duality of substance, the duality of properties as well. For example, 
Substance dualism says that there, there is a material or physical substance, such as the physical body that we have, or part of our body, such as the brain. Not only that, also we have immaterial, non-physical substance, such as, for example, the soul, the self, or even the mind. Okay, on the other hand, substance dualism also tells us that, tells us that there are two distinct properties, namely physical properties and mental properties. Physical properties are, for example, physical states of the brain, the firing of neurons in our brain. We do also have mental states. These mental states are said to be non-physical. They do not take up a space, for example. They do not extend in a space like physical objects, like a table or a chair or your own physical body or a car or something like that. So the, the, the key point here is that when it comes to substance dualism, we need to keep in our mind there are two distinct substances and two distinct properties. Well, not only that, let's look at the second kind of dualism. This, dualis this version of dualism is called property dualism. <laughs> property dualism takes two important things into account. First, there are distinct properties, but there's only one physical substance. So the better of those distinct properties is one single physical uh, substance, such as the body taken as a whole, or part of the body taken, such as the brain. These distinct properties are physical, the properties of the brain, and mental or psychological. Both physical properties and mental or psychological properties are being born by the same physical substance. The key point here, psychological properties are irreducible to physical properties, hence property dualism. So it's important to keep substance dualism and property dualism distinct. Substance dualism embraces two kinds of substances, material and immaterial. Property dualism completely gets rid of one of those substances, such as the, the, the non-physical substance, but embraces the distinction uh, uh, between physical properties and mental properties, but we cannot reduce uh, uh, psychological properties to physical properties. Okay. Now you might wonder, why is this important? Why is it important for us to understand the distinction between numerical identity and qualitative identity? Why is it important for us to understand the distinction between substance dualism and property dualism? You might say, that's a very good question. So when it comes to identity theory of mind, one way to look about identity theory of mind is, it's literally a reaction against uh, the kind of uh, dualism that I just explained, especially substance dualism. Substance dualism is saying that we do have, you know, two distinct substances and two distinct properties, mental and physical. When it comes to substance, the same thing, mental substance and physical substance. So identity theory of mind is really telling us the exact opposite of that. So if you have mental properties, for identity theory and identity theory or for defenders of identity theory, well, we're really not talking about two distinct properties. Mental properties are identical to physical properties. So you can take mental properties such as painfulness, you know, feeling the pain or headache. That is the same thing as neurons firing inside your brain. See fiber firing, philosophers say. But in what sense are we really kind of referring to identity? Uh, uh, at this point. Well, the sense of identity that we're talking about here, you might guess now, numerical identity. So we're not really talking about uh, you know, uh, different kinds of you know, qualitative identity. We're numerically really saying that mental properties are the same thing as physical property. So the identity has to be numerical. Here is what a philosopher by the name Paul Churchland actually uh, uh, says with respect to this very notion. Mental states are physical states of the brain. That is, each type of mental state or process is numerically identical with. That means that it is one and the very same thing as 
some type of physical state or process within the brain or central nervous system. So the key point here is that only physical substance and physical property exist. So no, uh, uh, you know, non-physical, for example, mental properties existing, existing on their own, right? No non-physical substance existing on its, on its own right. We do have only physical substance, such as the physical body taken as a whole, or part of the body taken, for example, such as the brain. We do have only physical property as well. Even if we say that mental properties do exist, mental properties, for example, uh, do not really have their own ontological uh, uh, existential status. Probably we're using two different you know, terms to describe one single thing. So identity theory is, you know, just talks about identity as the name, it's how the name itself actually sounds. Okay, now you might think that here, um, th there are people who really think that, uh, uh, well, if, if I am not really persuaded, for example, about you know, the identity theory, and how am I going to uh, you know, embrace this you know, theory itself? Well, people have pointed out some problems in identity theory. One of the problems, for example, people early on pointed out has to do with multiple realizability problem. Multiple realizability problem is a problem according to which, for example, various kinds of organisms with different physical mechanism can be in pain. So if the, the way our brain is organized is, is something that is facilitating, for example, for us to, for us to be able to uh, feel pain, then other organisms unlike us can also have similar experience with a complete different configuration and arrangement of the nervous system. In that case, then, well, identity theory, pain is identical to firing of neurons in our brain thesis claim is going to be in trouble. So therefore, people have is proposed, for example, because of this problem, probably functionalism is the way to go. Func functionalism is a view of mind. It simply kind of focuses on the input-output interaction. So you have input, you give out output. If something scratches my body, I go like, ouch, <laughs> I scream, and I just you know, ask for my friends or anyone who is around me uh, to render me some sort of help. So mental properties are nothing other than that. It's just in, input and output, input and output. That's it. Okay, even some people really kind of proposed eliminating materialism, for example. The mentalists described by Fox psychology do not actually refer to anything that actually exists. So this is, these are some of the alternative ways to deal with the problems that uh, identity theory is uh, said to suffer from. Now, you might think now the debate is over, so why should we even care about what we're doing and, and so on? Well, you might now uh, uh, be wondering now, okay, what, uh, what are we supposed to do about this problem? And uh, okay, who is the winner? How can we actually bring these uh, you know, diverse ways of looking at human nature to have some sort of common platform? Well, one of the problems that people really pointed out when it comes to identity theory is that when we think about our own mental states, we really come up with different um, qualitatively rich experiences. For example, there is, for instance, if I have a headache, there is something what it is like for me to have that kind of headache sensation. So therefore, it does not really seem to be the case that at least for some people, the qualitative feel the qualitative aspect of mental states can be reduced to nothing but the firing of neurons in our brain. Some people might also wonder, mental properties, most of them, at least not all of them, have intentionality. Intentionality is the concept of offness or aboutness. So we can direct our thoughts 
um, at, at uh, a certain object. For example, I can think about London. I can think about, uh, I don't know, Washington, D.C. So when I think about Washington, D.C. or uh, London, I am having London as an object of my thought. I can direct my thoughts at London. So London now becomes an object of my uh, thought. Uh, what is physical about that? And I am here in, let's say, Southern California, you know, thousands of miles away from London, but I'm able and capable of actually thinking about London. How's that happening? How's that physical? Okay. Mentalists are said to be owned by first person sentient subject uh, or subjects. I do have first person access to my own mental states. I can introspect my own mental states and I cannot do the same thing to my physical, for example, neurons that are firing and, and chemical signals in my brain, all kinds of neurotransmitters and so forth. I cannot really have access to uh, uh, those things, but I do have access to my own inner thoughts. So therefore, some people really say mental states by their, by their very nature resist any kind of elimination or reduction and they resist that because we do have first person access to uh, some of these features that mentalists actually have. So therefore, you might be wondering now, is this debate uh, a debate that can be put to rest at some point in the future? I am so sorry to break this bad news. I cannot guarantee that. I cannot give you that promise. I think this debate or debates are going to take place for uh, for a foreseeable future. And I think uh, people have different intuitions about what it means to be a human being. These intuitions probably might not converge anytime soon. Probably they might not converge. These are debates that have been happening since the time of Plato, even before Plato. You can go all the way to pre-Socratic uh, philosophers. And uh, still we're debating, still we're debating after over 2,000 years probably we will keep on debating about these issues. But the bottom line is, it's fun to think about these issues, it's fun to debate about these issues, and intellectually challenge ourselves. Thank you so very much for your attention. I hope you will do very, very well in your endeavors, and I wish you all the very best. And thank you so very much.